Hello everyone, this is Donna Tews, and I am so excited and grateful that you have taken time out of your busy day to spend it with me during this webinar. And my hope is to empower you today. My hope is that there is something that you can catch in this webinar that will serve you in your approach to, to supporting those that you know who have autism, who have ADHD. And I myself have dealt with this um, with this with the symptoms of autism and you will hear my story later on in this webinar and so buckle up there's a lot to cover and so I hope that you have your tea with you <laughs> and that you can find a place that you are not distracted and I know that when I'm watching or listening to a webinar and there's not a lot of engagement you can't see my face um, you can't see a lot of uh, movement on the screen you can tend to either tune out or you go on Facebook and that will not serve you in this webinar and so I really just encourage you to find some time in a closet if you have to <laughs> and just sit back and listen to some of the things that we're gonna discuss today for every one thing that I talk about today there's going to be or at least can be hours and hours of information. I can't talk about everything, um, but I can talk about some of these things in um, the surface. But I encourage you to go deeper in all of the things that we're gonna be discussing today because there is a wealth of information out there and we're just gonna touch on the surface of all of them. So first, is there an epidemic with autism and ADHD? And you betcha. You betcha, there are so many statistics out there in support of the fact that this is becoming an epidemic and is an epidemic. And some of the statistics we'll talk about here um, is that in 2014, it was estimated that one in 68 children have autism. So this was just last year. And when it comes to boys, that it's one in 54. Now compare that to the 80s when it was one in 10,000. And I've often heard a lot of different reasons for this. One reason being that, you know, it's over overdiagnosed or that the spectrum has widened. And so we just have more people within this paradigm. And although that can certainly be true, let's break it down to the fact that one in 68 children have autism or something like it. Whether this has increased as much as it has or even half as much, you have to agree with me that this is not okay. This is absolutely not okay with our children. What is wrong with our children that one in 68 people, one in 68 of them have autism or autism symptoms or whatever it is that you want to call it? There's something wrong here. It is estimated to cost, if you see the next statistic, at least $17,000 more per year to care for a child with ASD, which is the Autism Spectrum Disorder, compared to a child without ASD. Costs include healthcare education, ASD-related therapy, family-coordinated services, and caregiver time. For a child with more severe ASD, costs per year increase to over $21 thousand dollars and taken together it's estimated that total societal costs of caring for children with ASD were over nine billion in 2011 alone and so if you are living in Canada which you probably um, if you have been uh, shared this webinar with is possible but we I know that I talk and teach about this all over the world and so wherever you are the statistics are quite similar and by the year 2050 look at this statistic at the rate we are going every child will be on the autism spectrum what is happening and is there anything that we can do right and so we've talked about genetics so long with things like this there's nothing that is preventing the statistic. It's still rising even with the amount of studies and the amount of research that is out there on whether this is a genetic or not. It's not stopping this scenario. And so that's what I hope happens here today, that regardless of the root cause, and we can talk about some of the root causes, and we will today, 
Um, but regardless of that, is there anything we can do? So let's put aside all of our biases coming here to the webinar, whether you think it's one thing or a lot of things, whether you want to blame this or that, what can we do? And oftentimes, yes, getting to the root cause can be really valuable to us. But what I do know is that getting to the root cause of it being genetics is not serving us. It's not supporting this statistic and lowering it. And so what can we do regardless of whether it's genetics or not? And I hope that we all agree and we can all just start there from the same page. So we will again talk about some of the, some of the reasons that I believe uh, have been, become some of the theories. But again, it's not one, it's not the other, it's, it's maybe a combination of genetics and environment. So let's talk about some of these. Canaries in the coal mine, I refer to this a lot in, um, in my work with autism and ADHD. And the first time I heard this was with um, a doctor named Dr. Jerry, and the last name escapes me, I apologize, but he coined this term, um, at least for this group of children. And the reason why is because, and if you haven't heard of this, what they used to do back in mining days, when they used to go down in the mines, deep, deep in the mines, um, many miners would die, and they realized that it was because of the carbon, carbon monoxide toxicity that was happening, and a lot of these miners would die because they didn't have any warning signals. And someone brilliant decided that, you know, these canaries are very, very fragile, and their lungs are very fragile, and their bodies are very fragile. And even when they, these canaries would usually sing, and when they stopped singing, and they stopped their voice. And the miners knew that something had to change. The miners knew that something is wrong. And not only do we have to stop and change what we're doing, but we have to run the other direction. We have to get out of this scenario. We have to go and we have to go fast. And we call these kids the canaries in the coal mine. Because these kids are showing us how sensitive they are. And whether that's the genetic predisposition or not is not the point. But it is a very interesting theory that these kids have a predisposition to the things that we are doing in our environment that is causing them to have these symptoms. And we need to stop and we need to listen to these kids who are losing their voice. And we need to stop and run the other way and we need to do it fast and we need to do it now. So that's why we call them the canaries in the coal mine. So typical treatments, we've seen a lot of different medications being prescribed to these children. What's your favorite side effect, right? Um, I know a lot of parents who are, they love their children and they are hearing from teachers who are saying, you need to put these children on these medications because these children are not coping. And parents who have no idea what else to do, of course they're going to be going on these medications. So we cannot judge. And if this is you, if you are one of those parents who have your child on medication, I do not judge you. And in fact, I know you do this because you love your child. And bravo for loving your child enough to doing what it is that you know is best for them. So what I know for sure is that today we're going to be offering some alternatives, not as an alternative to what you're doing, but as an, um, a complementary approach to what you are already doing. And for those of you who have chosen not to go on medication, but are, are still seeing the results of what some of these symptoms can do to your children, um, I, wanted, I want to empower you with some of the thoughts that behind this webinar that are going to teach you that there are complementary, complementary therapies to the therapies that are out there. My son, they wanted to have 40 hours of therapy a week. What could, what could I have done in addition to that, right? So we're going to talk about that. I do have a very, I, I will be honest and raw with you here. Um, I do not believe that many of our children need to be on these medications because of these side effects, especially the long-term side effects. If this is something that parents choose to do short-term, then I have way less of an issue with that than the long-term medications, especially because you're going to learn some things today that are going to serve you and your children and your whole family 
that you can now either start to um, see a, a minimizing of some of the symptoms so that maybe you just don't have to be on so much medication or maybe you can eliminate them altogether with your doctor's approval, of course. And so with that being said, the summary is not intended as individual medical advice. <laughs> and I'm going to just read this so that you're very clear on where I'm coming from here. People should consult their healthcare practitioner for how to best treat their individual child. Each disease or disorder mentioned here is individual and requires individual assessment. One approach that helps one individual may not help others. This summary represents the personal views of Donna Tews and does not necessarily represent the views of the Institute of Natural Nutrition or anywhere that you will find um, anywhere out there. Now, or the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition, which is where I went. So... All right, we're going to dive. You ready? <laughs> Early intervention, so before pregnancy, we know and there has been enough study now that we know that what is happening with our kids, whether genetics or not, starts before pregnancy. And we are housing in our bodies, so listen up women, but also listen up men if you're listening to this. We are creating a human being that will grow to over 150 pounds and obviously that's average right so we're talking about men and women and and that varies obviously but you are housing that human species and so how do you give them the best start in life it's with you it's with your body it's with your stress level, it's with your nutrition level, it's with your gut flora, and we're gonna talk about all of these today. But before pregnancy is the best time to start. The next best time to start is during pregnancy, and just being very cautious of the toxicity that you bring into your body. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that. Before the age of six, now once you have a child, before the age of six, we've, we've noticed in our experience that before the age of six is a really powerful um, age for children and that they exponentially grow, their cells exponentially grow. And so if you're doing anything, any type of intervention, start now. If your child is before six, don't wait. Don't think that they're going to grow out of the symptoms that you're seeing. If they're diagnosed with autism, don't think they will grow out of it. Even with therapy, they don't grow out of this, some stuff like this. And, and why I say that is because that was something that I was told when my children, when my son um, was two and he didn't speak. And I was told he will grow out of it and, and was told many, many stories out there of how some children just all of a sudden start to speak at three. This is a myth. This is not something that is common. And so if that happened to one or two kids, it is not common. And so please don't hold on to that. Start now looking into some things that you can do. If it's after six, if your child is, if you're here and your child or the, some, somebody, your grandchild or um, a friend's child has autism or ADHD, it does not mean that there's no hope if you, if they are over six years old. And in fact, I've met and worked with many kids and even adults who are over six who have, um, who I have seen some major dramatic results and, uh, and you'll find that as well. And so one of the things <laughs> that you are going to see me talk about a lot in my practice is elimination diet. And there's many reasons for this, but let's just talk about the first two main ones. And this is the first diet that I chose to put my son on. And it's called gluten and dairy. <laughs> And I've heard and spoke with dietitians who feel like people um, like naturopaths will put everybody on the gluten-free, dairy-free diet. Well, you know what? There's a good reason for that. And when I first went to my dietitian and I told her that some things were changing with this diet alone, uh, before I mentioned that, I said, you know, they asked me if I had went to a naturopath. I said, no. And they said, oh, that's good because they put everybody on the gluten-free, dairy-free diet. And had they only known that this diet alone in the first two weeks of my son's um, journey with this approach to his health, if they had only known that this was the one that served him the most and got me to thinking there is definitely something to do with his gut when it comes to these types of issues. And so 
Um, at that point, I was not brave enough and I, didn't, I was not educated enough to say anything. And so I smiled and nodded and giggled a little bit with them. And <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is intimidating. I'm not going to say anything. And that's unfortunate because now I do have a voice that's a lot different. Sorry about the battery power. Um, and so what I ended up doing was the elimination diet for the first two weeks. And you will see dramatic changes. Um, and when I say will, um, I take it back because it all depends on your child. And one of the types of children that, um, that I strongly recommend working with in, if your child has issues of digestive issues, if you see constipation, if you see diarrhea, if you see rashes, unexplainable rashes, if, you, if your child has um, ear infections, chronic ear infections, respiratory issues, I'm talking any of these things, these are the types of children that I see the most dramatic results with this type of elimination diet. Now, does it mean if they had no issues at all before they started these diets, that's actually going to um, change them? Well, no. Or that's not going to change them? Well, no. But I'm just telling you that in my experience, it's those children that I work with um, most. And to be honest, saying all of that, most of the children who come to me with autism or ADHD have digestive issues. And that's just bottom line. Okay, so this is going to serve them a lot. Now, why gluten and casein? If you think of your food as a chain of pearls, right? So all the, the protein of gluten, casein, let's just talk about the, the protein itself is a chain of pearls. When you put it in your mouth, you chew, and hopefully you're chewing. Um, you chew and you break down these chains into individual pearls. And typically that goes down into the stomach, which breaks it down even more. And then into the enzymes will break it down more, small intestine. That's when you absorb some of these nutrients. Now, um, there's a lot of different theories out there, but one of the, one of the theories in, behind this is that there's a, a string of pearls. And whether it's because we're not chewing well enough, whether it's because we don't have enough acid in our stomach, whether it's because we don't have enough enzymes um, or whether it's or because we have a leaky gut, and we'll talk about that soon, these sometimes these chains of pearls don't break down into individual pearls. And it's usually once they break down into individual pearls that are um, – that are in small intestine will grab onto these small chains of pearls and bring it into the, the small intestine into past the intestinal wall into the bloodstream. And it goes then to the heart, the kidneys, the liver, the brain, wherever it needs it, it to be, the body will take it and do an amazing thing and just bring it where it needs. But sometimes these one individual pearls don't get broken down. And so you get these, these chain, larger chains of five pearls. And if you have something, say, like a leaky gut, which now means that you have a porous intestinal wall and these five chains of pearls can actually get moved into the intestine and into the small or, or into the bloodstream and go where it needs to go. And oftentimes it goes into the brain and you'll see here that it creates an opioid effect. And so you see at the top these squiggly little things. These are the proteins. They're getting in as large chains. See the arrows? getting in as large change, chains and moving across that red line, which is the blood-brain barrier, into the brain. And it's creating a lot of these symptoms that we're seeing. Now, this, again, is a theory that has been um, talked about a lot. But it, when you remove the gluten and the casein protein, so gluten is from anything from wheat to um, some some most not oats per se, but a lot of oats are cross contaminated with gluten. Um, you have rye and barley and those types of things. And then casein is anything that comes from the milk of an animal. Okay. So uh, eggs does not have casein, but milk does, cheese does, yogurt, cottage cheese, uh, even a goat's milk has casein. Okay. And a lot of people say, oh, it's different. And yeah, it can be for your child, but it still has casein. And I know for our son, when we removed it, we, he could not have the casein from goat's milk either. And so again, everybody's different. And so this is why something like gluten and casein can be a powerful elimination for, the, for these autistic and, and uh, ADHD kids. 
we can talk a lot about diet and um, and eliminating, but the point is also to give back. I have seen a lot of people who are unhealthy because they've decided to become a vegetarian or a vegan, or they've be, they've decided to be a raw foodist or a fruitarian or whatever the case may be. And the problem with some of the the diets out there. Um, and even the GAPS diet or the specific carbohydrate diet is that they're eliminating a lot of things, but they're not adding a lot of the proper nutrients. And so you see on the top right hand of your screen, the raw food diet. So we, you know, this is a, a, a triangle. I love this triangle. I love this food pyramid here. It's my favorite one. Um, water, we all need water. We're about at least 70% water. And so you you know, we need to have good drinking water. Leafy greens is the next one that I would say have the most of. Vegetables, fruits, sprouts, nuts and seeds, herbs and juicing grasses, algae. I mean, these will serve your body in a living way, like nobody's business. And so you can talk to me all you want about meat and dairy and casein and grains and all of that other stuff. And, and that's fine. But um, I would say that that should be the, the least on your plate not the most on your plate, which is what we tend to do in North America. So proper nutrition is something that really serves our kids well. And my son, uh, when we put him on this raw food pyramid diet, um, he soared. And, and again, you're going to hear the, the bulk of my story, but, uh, and I'll, I'll share that with you, but what he d became, what he became was more grounded than I'd ever seen him ever in his life. When we didn't just start, stop, or when we stopped just taking away and we started to add. So that's so important, and I hope you hear that from me here. Brain allergies, this is a big one. Uh, the, you see the difference uh, here, and you, you see IgE, and then you'll see IgG. These are what I term brain allergies in some ways. There's other different responses that the body will have, but let's just talk about the brain and what it can do for the brain or to the brain. IgE, just so that you know, this is when you go to the doctor and they do that kind of back scratch test or the scratch test on your arm. And this is an immediate response. This is um, your immune system responding to peanuts, right? And so that's an, oftentimes that's an immediate response. So anaphylactic shock would be an immediate response. Hives, an immediate response, right? Sometimes certain rashes are an immediate response. But what the, what the Western medical community has not taken into consider, consideration of, and, and there are some doctors who are starting to do this now, so they're, they're starting to understand that this is real, and, uh, and they need to also look into this for some of these kids, but is an IgG response, which in some cases can not happen right away. And sometimes it can happen in a couple of hours, sometimes 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours. And so when we're doing these elimination diets and then we reintroduce foods, sometimes we, we often tell people, wait three days of one food product that you're reintroducing. So if you do the gluten-free and the dairy-free diet, when you're reintroducing, only reintroduce one at a time. So reintroduce just gluten, not dairy. And do it for three days and see if there's a difference. And do journals. Journals, I'm big on journals. Write down the before and after. <laughs> and and oftentimes, you'll, you'll take a piece of bread after a, a large detox or a long detox, and nothing will happen right away, and you'll be like, oh, good, I'm, it's, it's okay for bread. Or you get an, an immediate response like, oh, you know, it, it doesn't feel very good. And so you have that IgE response, or maybe it is an IgG response, but it's not an anaphylactic shock or a hive, so you don't think of it as much you know, bad to do with you. And so that immediate kind of gut feeling, you're like, oh, maybe it's just because I'm not used to it. And I've heard that being tossed around out there. I'm just not used to it. And so my body's getting reused to eating that. Well, no, that's actually not what happens. And you need to listen to your body. Because when you're reintroducing something that causes your stomach to be upset, that's your body talking to you. And many, many times, in many cases that I've seen, People have had that immediate response and then they just keep eating it thinking that it's just their body and their body, guess what their body does? It stops talking to them in that way. And unfortunately, then that's where we get into trouble because the body will start to talk in a different way. So I hope you hear that. 
that if we have something, we reintroduce it, it's not just because our, our body's not used to it. Because if you in, introduce a, a piece of celery or a kale and you chew it well enough, <laughs> then your body's not going to respond that way, is it? So it's not because your body is just not used to it. Because then it would be like that for if you, you get rid of celery in your life and bring it back after two weeks. But you never see that unless the person has an allergy to celery. And so we need to get that kind of idea out of our heads and understand that sometimes these IgG responses um, in, in the way of gut or in the way of these brain allergies, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but um, can happen in 24, 48 hours. And so that's why when we're reintroducing, it's really important to listen to your body. Some brain allergies, now listen to this, and look, just look at the percentages of this. There was a study by the Lancet, no doubt, okay, that was 64% of these kids were allergic to cow's milk. Look at that percentage, and this is an IgG response. And so chances are that our kids are allergic to cow's milk. And I don't recommend anybody drink cow's milk. I have my own other reasons for that, which is beyond the scope of this webinar. But this is really huge. And so, and what happens sometimes is that you can get these responses in the brain. And I remember when we had done a, a long, like we were on an elimination diet for years. And we ended up finding out that fruit had bothered my son in, much, in a lot of ways. And we had taken him off of fruit for a different reason, we introduced a banana, just a banana. And 24 hours to the hour, my son had more autistic symptoms come back to him than he had had in the last year alone. And so for him, we recognized that whether it's all fruit or just the, the type of fruit that we have here um, is no good for him. And so again, every child is different. An IgG, you can order an IgG panel, and I will show you a link later on in this webinar where you can find that. Um, you can also do an elimination diet like we did if you can't afford these panels, because you can get all of these different panels. You can get a chemical panel, panel an IgG panel, an oats you know, panel, <laughs> and all of these different things. If you can afford it, then do it, it's faster. But the elimination diet serves you in a way that these panels don't because oftentimes you get false negatives or false positives. So um, look at these other things on the list just quickly. 59% chocolate. Um, now it doesn't specify what type of chocolate. I'm assuming it's not raw cacao. If you heard of that, that's the raw chocolate bean. Um, and when you cook any type of chocolate, you lose the benefits of chocolate. So for those of you who love dark chocolate and have heard of these studies, if it's raw, you're going to get a lot more benefit than if it's cooked raw or dark chocolate. 49% uh, wheat, 45% to oranges. I know my kids can't have citrus fruit. 39% to eggs, 32% to peanuts, and 16% to sugar. And a lot of people have asked, why is sugar so low? Well, sugar has a lot of different spiking issues with your blood sugar levels, but um, this is in regards to IgG response. So yes, sugar is an issue, but the IgG response is uh, what this list is talking about. So candida, you must have heard of candida by now. And, um, and my son had this as well. And so let's quickly go through this. Again, look into this because this is huge for these kids. And for the parents of these kids, also look into this. Overuse and misuse of prescription antibiotic steroids. Again, chicken or the egg, right? What happened first? Are these kids prone to infection? And that just means that they need more antibiotics. Some prescription drugs, you know, uh, also cause some of these things. Steroids <laughs> uh, will, um, will cause a lot of uh, issues with the gut flora. Gut flora, by the way, if I haven't talked about it, is the good bacteria in our gut. And we have been living with these and coexisting with these for, I'm talking millions of years, thousands of years, depending on your persuasion. <laughs> and we need them now to survive. They actually help and, and function along with our immune system and different parts of our body. So they, they keep pathogenic bacteria at bay. They keep the candida at bay. And if we wipe out those good soldiers, then guess what happens? Candida overruns. And when candida or pathogenic bacteria overruns, we have lots of inflammation in the gut and a lot of mucus formation. And that's, that's some of the, the theory behind that uh, leaky gut that we talked about earlier. Um, and of course, 
you know, candida releases a lot of toxins when they poo all over your intestines. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just being raw and honest with you here. Uh, weakens immune system, ADHD and hyperactivity, you know, results because your immune system is wonky, right? Um, and that's a whole other topic. Again, we can go into that and the link between that, but we're not going to get into that. Reoccurring, infection illness, and then it, the cycle continues. All right? And of course, growth of candida is encouraged and proliferated by the standard American diet. So simple carbs, simple sugars, your dairy, which is a lot of sugar, uh, poultry and beef antibiotics. You know, a lot of them have a standard antibiotic, antibiotics given to them. And so when you eat them, and antibiotics do what? They kill the what? They kill the bad bacteria. They kill bacteria. Do you think that they only get after the bad bacteria? Well, no. Uh, they also kill the good bacteria. And so if you're eating poultry or beef that has been given antibiotics, well, where are the antibiotics going? Well, they're going in your mouth and then into your colon where your gut flora thrive and, um, and you're killing them. And, you know, you should also look into the water that you're drinking as well. Chlorine is a great example of this. We talk a lot about, oh, chlorine's good. It's great. Can you tell me what chlorine is good for? I know this is off topic, but it, it, it well, actually, it's not off topic because tell me what it does. What, why do they add chlorine to water? Because it kills what? Because it kills the pathogenic bacteria. But guess what else it kills? It kills the good bacteria. And so when you're drinking this, what is it doing to the good bacteria in your body? And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Just look into this. We need to be thinking eaters and drinkers. So biochemical balancing, this is so huge with our kids. Um, uh, there's a list here. And again, write these down and look into each one individually. What I will say about um, B12 here, as you see that, and zinc, is that what I know now to be true is that B12 doesn't exist or work or get metabolized in the body without B6 or B5. If you, you can put a high dose of B12, you can even inject it into the bloodstream. But the cell is not going to metabolize it and do, the body's not going to do with B12 what it wants to do unless you also have B5 and B6 and all of the other B vitamins to help that B12 metabolize into the cell and by the cell. So I used to be against uh, whole food vitamins and minerals, and now I, I really support it in, in my kids and myself. And I've seen drastic effects when given um, multivitamins and minerals. And we'll talk about the different types that you should you know, use to serve your body, but I just wanted to touch on that. Enzymes, a lot of these kids are depleted in, en in enzymes. So we're talking digestive enzymes and systemic. Systemic enzymes help to detox the body and help to get rid of an eat up kind of deal some of the toxins in the body antioxidants are huge um, we'll talk a little bit about that and blood sugar regulation is another huge thing especially for temper tantrums and for um, some of these the anger issues that you see in some of these kids there was a study done um, on a juvenile institution where they just re um, they just removed sugar and I'm, I'm not clear on the food diet, but they removed sugar from the diet. And guess what happened? These kids m were minimizing um, and in some cases eliminated violence and suicide. And so you can understand the power behind regulating blood sugar levels in our kids. So these are just a few things, selenium, glutathione, um, a whole discussion in and of itself. But again, write this down and, and look into it. Supplements. So one or all at the same time. We talked about this. So you need to serve your kids with organic. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. But whole food minerals need to be considered. There are, if you even go to the health food store, there is even a lot of synthetics on the shelves there. And it, it saddens me because this is a health food store. You know, there's a grocery store and then there's a health food store. I don't know why there should be a different name, but we know in North America that there definitely should be a different name. And so um, the, we need whole food vitamins and minerals in our bodies, not synthetics, all right? We're not made of synthetics, so we should not be trying to serve our body with them. 
Omega three, six, and nine. I've worked with autism or ADHD kids, and sometimes when you just balance their three, six, and nine omegas for their brain, then you will uh, receive um, you will receive a difference in attention and activity, hyperactivity. You will serve their bodies in a more balanced way by just balancing these omegas. And again, look into that because that's huge for these kids. Um, some of these omegas can be more bioavailable. Uh, we also use essential oils with that, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, detoxifying your child. Toxins in the home is huge for these kids. There's been a lot of studies in regards to genetics and environment with autism, and more and more studies are now showing that there is a link between autism and, and both toxins in the home and toxins in the body and where we're getting it from. And so we need to look at what we're putting in our hand soaps, in our candles, in our laundry detergent. We need to look at some of the toxins in our food, the pesticides, the fungicides, the chemicals, the herbicides, the artificial flavoring, the food dye. These are all toxins in the body that a lot of these kids cannot get rid of. And so it continues to store up and store up and store up. Uh, the risk of having um, ASD in a study increased with the poundage of pesticides applied and with the proximity of the women's homes to the fields. Now, this is when we're talking about uh, being pregnant, watching your your body when you're being when you're pregnant or when you're preparing your body to be pregnant. This is huge. And look at the increase. There was a, a statistically significant increase with the poundage of pesticides applied to the farms that they're living around and these women who live near them. And so this toxicity issue is huge and we cannot take that for granted when we are bringing in uh, toxins in our home. And they now say that, um, of course, we can't avoid pollution outside of our home, but we can control a lot of the pollution we bring inside. And they're saying that the, the air quality in our homes is now worse than the air quality outside of our homes. So do we just throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, we're all gonna die anyways? Well, no, because we can see an effect and we can do something. If you walk out of your home, you can say, oh yeah, you know what, I'm gonna die if I go outside because there's pollution. Okay, well, you know what, you're right, you can't, you can't control that, but you can support your body so that your body can actually minimize the assault of these toxins. And I, you know, I can't stress these things enough. And when you have the control of what you bring in the house, don't throw up your hands in the air. Don't do that because you have control of what you bring in the house. There's a lot of things we have control over and we spend a lot of times indoors. So just something to think about. Um, we're going to get a little bit into essential oils now and detoxification for those kids who have um, heavy metal poisoning. I haven't talked about that a lot, um, but it's something definitely to uh, talk about, whether it's lead or mercury or um, or a lot of these other things. And there, I, I need to stress that if you use something like cilantro to detoxify, it goes on the bottom of the feet, not internally. And algae needs to be taken with this because we don't want this to the the any heavy metals, for instance, to be taken out of the cell only to be moved somewhere else where it can get more stuck and harder to get out. And so be very cautious with this and always, always use algae. So chlorella is the one that I choose to use. Chlorella in and of itself is a heavy detoxi detoxifier. And so even just using chlorella alone is, is a, a beautiful approach to detoxifying you and your child. But um, cilantro using um, uh, on the bottom of the feet. And what I do is I, uh, I use it just one drop a couple of times a day on the bottom of the feet. One drop on each foot. Okay? Okay, so essential oils. This serves you in a way, um, and, and, and what I will say is, because our kids have a hard time detoxifying, please be careful at the grade of oils that you're using. Um, we, there is no standardized regulation on essential oils, and if you choose one just off the health food store, we talked about the health food store and not really being privy to uh, whole food anything or everything, and so we want to really be cautious on the essential oils because there's no regulating standard. So they can put any kind of synthetic material in their essential oils and call it 100% pure, call it whatever they want. They can dilute it. 
Um, they can grow it anywhere they want to. But what I have noticed in, in my research now is that essential oils should not be just grown in one region alone. And lavender is a great example of that, even though we're not going to talk about that. But lavender is grown in France, where the altitude is different. The ecosystem is just different all around. The different soil composition, like I said, different altitude, different seasonal temperatures. And what's going to happen if you grow lavender there? What's going to happen to the chemical constituents within that plant? It's going to be the best chemical constituent balance the high alcohols, the low ketones, and it's going to serve you in a way that no other lavender across the world could. Because we're not just after pure, we are after chemical constituents and the balance of those. And, and whether or not it has high alcohols, high linalols, or whether it has low ketones, those are so important. And even if you grab the same seed from France and you come and grow it in, in Canada soil or the US soil, What's going to happen to the chemical constituents in that plant? It's going to change and won't be as effective. And so be aware of the company that you're choosing. Uh, I choose doTERRA. The reason why I choose doTERRA because of this, some of the things that I just mentioned. I also choose it because it's beyond organic. I know that the organic standards here in Canada and the U.S. allow for synthetic pesticides. And they just say it's just the safer of synthetic of the, of the pesticide. So if there's no known studies that say that these synthetics are causing harm, then we are allowing it in our certification of organics. Whereas doTERRA, we test for pesticides and fungicides and herbicides, and there are no known pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides found, or that it won't pass their certification standard. Um, they also test for microbes. Um, they're testing for mold, right? And, and these small mom and pop, you know, well-meaning, um, well-meaning essential oil companies, they, they, they have 100% pure. Absolutely. They, they love and serve it with energy. Absolutely. But do they do all of these tests? And I don't want microbes or mold in my essential oils. And I don't want it just grown in Canada or the U.S. I want it grown across the world. And I want my oils to be you know, I want the farmers to be served because as I'm serving my children, I want to serve those around the world. And so the company of doTERRA that I have chosen serves all of these things that are close to my heart. So now let's talk about what these specific essential oils can do to serve you. Balance and serenity. These are two blends that I use. So we're going to go back and forth here. But balance and serenity, it doesn't matter the mind mood management issue that it is. But these are the two oils that I use as a foundation for anything to do with getting past the blood-brain barrier and mind mood management. So first balance, um, we want these kids to be grounded, don't we, right? Of course, not in the grounded sense of you got into trouble, which sometimes that happens too. <laughs> we want this grounded. And, and for those parents who have these kids, you know what I mean by this. There's just something about them where they're just not present. They're just not grounded. And so this is one of the ones that I use. I use it again on the bottom of the foot. When I wipe it on the bottom of the foot, and I sometimes get them, depending on their age, to do it on their own foot, one drop, it's all you need, right? And then I get them to inhale it through their nasal cavities because that's where the olfactory bulbs are. A chemical reaction happens within each of these olfactory bulbs, and it goes into a, the limbic system. And that's where that fight or flight response is and, and the calming effect can occur there. Um, you see this, uh, this, I'm not going to play the video, but the before and after. And within 30 seconds of putting it on the bottom of the foot, you see on the left, these are, the, these are what the cells look like. And on the right, look at the cells. And look at how this essential oil blend serves the cells after only 30 seconds. And only one drop can do that. And there's, there are like 40 million trillion cells or molecules in one drop of oil. And we don't even have that many cells in our body. And so you can understand the power of this type of essential oil. Serenity is the next one I choose um, for mind mood management issues. Again, I put it on the bottom of the foot, one drop. Sometimes I'll put one drop on the heart. Again, just to get that aromatic molecule getting into and rising into the olfactory bulbs, smelling that in the hands. Um, again, this is used for calming and it has served for um, people that I know who have anxiety and it just calms them. Great for right before sleep um, to support a beneficial sleep and rest. 
Frankincense, this is the king of all oils. And the most powerful way that we can use frankincense is in a diffuser. Essential oils act systemically. So basically what that means is that whether you put it internally or externally on the skin or in a diffuser and you're breathing it through your lungs or your olfactory bulbs, it is getting through to the bloodstream. And that's what is really powerful about essential oils. And so frankincense is one of those ones is just powerful. And we have noticed that it serves these kids with autism um, in particular in a diffuser. We used to go on the back of the neck when I first started, but the more research that I did and the more that I worked with these kids, the more I realized that the most powerful way is putting it in a diffuser at night and uh, while they sleep. So easy, right? Especially these kids who have sensory integration disorder, who don't maybe like the smell of it, wait till they fall asleep, put it in the room and serve them in that way. And within weeks, I have seen just some major transformations in some of these kids. And so this is what I have used um, for my son and especially for memory and um, just uh, for him, it's the speech memory. Uh, that served him the most with frankincense and again that grounding. For those kids who have uh, ADHD, I've used vetiver for clarity of thought and some focus and for sleep. And again, I'll put this on the bottom of the feet. Now, I love the smell of vetiver. It comes from the root of this plant, this beautiful plant you see, it goes deep, deep down into the earth. And I love the smell of this. It smells like wet dirt. <laughs> so you can understand some of these kids who have sensory integration disorder don't like the smell of certain things may not like this but many of them actually do because they like the smell of dirt and um, I, I use this in, uh, in in so many different people's lives and that sleep is definitely one of them I've heard of people saying that when they take vetiver that their dreams are heightened and sometimes you know, kids will have nightmares. I haven't personally experienced that in any of the people that I've worked with. But one thing I know to be true about sleep is that it doesn't matter so much about how much sleep you get, although we do want a lot of hours. But what is happening? What are the cycles that are happening during that sleep? You can have 10 hours of sleep and not feel rested. You can have five hours of sleep and feel more rested than somebody who just had that 10 hours of sleep. And the reason is because of that REM cycle. All right, it's that stage of REM. And this is now where they know you have dreams. And so when somebody comes to me and says, well, you know, this person had a nightmare or a dream, they, they dreamed more vividly, I'm not surprised by that because the essential oils, when they help with these cycles of sleep and help allow you to get into that REM sleep where you're finally dreaming for the first time, well, of course, this is going to feel different and strange to you. And nightmares, if you look at dream research and dream study and people who do these, I used to think that it's hokey, but now I realize that, you know, perhaps there's something to this. Sometimes when we have REM, not sometimes, but when we have REM sleep, do you know that the brain is actually detoxifying? But it's not just detoxifying something physical. Work with me on this. Oftentimes the brain is also detoxifying our emotions throughout that day. The body is a beautiful thing. It wants to serve you. That's why when you're hungry, your body tells you it's hungry. Your body growls. The next time you feel your stomach growling, you should thank your body because it's, it's giving you that indication that this body needs to food in it right now. Our body loves you. <laughs> and dreams are a way for your body perhaps to detoxify those emotions. And so nightmares might be a way that's telling you, you know what, something, something happened today and something maybe has been repressed and you're not getting it out. And so I'm going to get it out tonight during this REM sleep of detoxification. Now, some of you may think that's, that's off the cuff, but you know what? Enough research has been done that's showing me that there's something to that. So don't be afraid, but if you're getting recurrent nightmares, maybe it's telling you something. And if your kids are having recurrent nightmares, maybe it's talking to you, to them too. Maybe it's just trying to get out some of the fears that these kids are having. So there's a lot of things above and beyond a lot of the things we're talking about today. Stress for these kids, you, you can serve them in that way. You can serve them in a way like talk to them 
and 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 try to try to nurture them and show them as much love and compassion and patience as you possibly can. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but I wanted to just get that out there with, with people who are going to notice some of these things when you have a better sleep. <laughs> uh, wild orange, what I know about wild orange is that it helps support glutathione processing in the body. And it's also another anti-anxiety calming one. Um, now, my son taught me this. Allow your children to choose which oil will serve them best. And I wanted to give my son just serenity one time for sleep. Because what wild orange does to me, it's my happy oil. And it makes me feel elevated and happy. But he wanted it right before sleep. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to elevate him with wild orange. So I'm not going to put it in his diffuser at night. I want it to be in the morning or the lunch or noon hour or uh, supper time. But he kept telling me he wanted wild orange to sleep. And I kept saying, no, no. Finally, I'm like, you know what? You keep asking for this. So I'm just going, going to do it. Do you know that he had such a restful sleep when he chose wild orange and when I finally let his body choose what was going to serve him? And so let these kids choose which one is going to work for them. I know that most autistic kids, and I say most even though I haven't met one who doesn't, loves wild orange. And maybe it's because their body is saying we do need this glutathione processing. A lot of these kids are lacking that processing. And so maybe it's telling them that. And it is an anti it's a calming one, I mean. And so maybe that's what they need. Allow your kids to choose. Let them, let them experience the aroma for themselves and choose which one is right for them. Digestive support. This is huge. Digestive support equals immune support. You know that most of our immune system is in our digestive system, right? And so if you clean up our gut, then you clean up our immune system. Um, it also has a link with mental health. And so here's a great example is serotonin, which you, you know is um, kind of our happy neurotransmitter. And um, pharmaceutical companies really target serotonin for people with depression. But what they're not realizing, maybe, <laughs> and what they're not doing, and of course, they, they want that Band-Aid fix. That's what pharmaceutical drugs kind of do, right? It's like, let's get to the symptom and let's fix that, that symptom. Um, but do you know, and listen to this, do you know that serotonin, more serotonin, is found in your gut than anywhere else in the body? I'm going to repeat that. More serotonin is found in your gut than anywhere else in the body. Guess what that means? I think they're going after the wrong place. And you talk to people with IBS and stress will cause more digestive issue. And when you have more digestive upset, you have more sluggishness, memory, fogginess. All of these things are affected. And I have seen whether you have autism or ADHD or anything, any mind mood management or not, I have seen that when you allow the body to heal the gut by giving the body what it needs, like proper nutrition and some of the other things that we described, then you help the body heal the mind. All right? I was told that my son would have a high probability um, or that he had a neurological disorder and that he, this disor disorder would, is, is not something that is temporary, that this is a neurological disorder that he would have for the rest of his life. And when you hear my story, you may be shocked to discover that I don't believe that that's true at all. The next thing you see on this list is probiotics. Run, run, run to get these probiotics. I, um, in, in researching more about this company of doTERRA, what I've realized is that they have the best probiotics on the market. And it's for those who can swallow capsules. And the reason why is because it bypasses the acidity of the stomach. And the bacteria still is alive by the time it actually gets to the colon where these good bacteria live and colonize. Um, and there are, if you don't, you know, if they don't swallow pills, then find a, a powder formula that is formulated to bypass the acidity of the stomach. I have seen people use enemas, you know, to get into the colon, directly into the colon to help these probiotics colonize. So just some thoughts. Um, down the road, I mean, some people who have used uh, yogurt and almond yogurt or coconut yogurt, and that also can help support getting that to the colon. So enzymes, we talked a little bit about that, so I'm going to skip over that. Digestin, this is um, another essential oil blend that 
because these kids are prone to having digestive issues, this can serve them in a way that, um, that I absolutely love. And my kids can be buckled over in pain and, and, and on the couch. And five minutes later after using Digest Zen, they're up and they're running around. And I've seen this time and time again with other kids. Um, GX Assist, this is another product that I love because it's a cleanse. And so we want to talk about cleansing the colon, cleansing the, the digestive tract, right? Uh, Zendocrine for visceral organs. So this is for the liver to support the liver and the functioning of the kidneys and, you know, just getting these detoxing or these toxins out. Liver is our major detox organ. So is the skin, by the way. So if you see a lot of rashes on your kids, that's a sign that something inside the body is wanting something outside, something to get outside. And the skin is the largest organ, and so it, it will use that organ, sometimes the weakest areas, to get it out of the body. Um, so this is a whole family intervention. Um, if you are here as a practitioner with these families, be bold, absolutely, but please be gentle. Um, as a mom, I remember the, the challenge of feeling very alone and feeling very judged and feeling very guilty and thinking that what I did to my kids, what I did to my son was horrible and, and it was my fault. And I don't want any of you to feel that way. I know you love your children. And if there are things that we can do, then let's start now today doing them. But don't look back and say, if I had only, if I had only, because that gets you nowhere except stress. And stress is not going to serve you as this person's parent, as this person's grandparent. It's not going to serve you, especially if you're the grandparent and you judge the parent. Um, this mother or father, and even if they don't listen to you after you hear a, a webinar like this, just love them and, and serve them where they're at and, and encourage them that they are doing the best that they can. And sometimes you just have to let go. And if they see you creating change for yourself, then that will encourage them to make changes for themselves and maybe for their children. So please don't judge those outside of your circle or inside of your circle who are working their butts off to do what they feel is best for their child. I, you can send them this webinar, um, absolutely. And I would love for you to do that because I do want to get the word out and I wish this webinar was here when I first found out about my son. And making it as easy as possible for you, find support. Find somebody who's going to support you. I never went to a naturopath, and I wish that I did. Um, I never went to the Hippocrates Institute, which is where I now recommend people run to um, when this, something like this happens. Because it's just easier. It's absolutely easier when you have somebody helping you and holding your hand along the way instead of doing it all yourself on top of everything else that you're doing. It is hard to have AKA, otherwise known as normal children, never mind adding something like this on top of it. So try to make this as easy as possible. When we started going gluten-free and dairy-free, it was very difficult. I remember standing in front of the grocery um, uh, kind of aisles and just crying because I didn't know what to feed my children. And I knew instinctively that the things that I had been given them was, were no good for them. But here I am trying to make the best decision and I'm standing there and I don't know what to give them. And it's difficult and it takes so much time and effort and I can't eat out anymore. And it was so difficult. But know that today there's so much more support for you than there ever was when I started this. And so although it's tough and the beginning is the most tough, I encourage you that you, you know, when you get support and there's so much out there now, then you can do this. And I believe in you strongly. Love and patience and support. Love for you. Love for your child. When you start down this path, it will get harder before it gets easier. I promise you that. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way our body can sometimes work. When I started giving my son the gluten-free diet and the dairy-free diet, he got so constipated that with the x-ray that we had to take because he just wasn't going for days and days and days and days on end. He had so much stool up the yin yang that you saw it up behind his rib cage. And this was from a child who's been constipated for a long time. And so, um, patience, patience, just because they get worse doesn't mean it's not working. 
Sometimes it means that it is working and it's a sign that it's working. But when you follow along with a healthcare professional, they can share these things with you and they can walk alongside you. Um, discussions with people in this realm, right? Have discussions with people, talk to people. That got me through this. I found forums online of people who were doing these types of things for their children. And, um, and, and we just need to love each other, not judge each other and be patient. So this is my children. These are my children. The guy, the blondie on the right. <laughs> we found out when he was five that he had autism. And we knew that there was something wrong when he started losing some language and losing the sign language that he had. Um, but we never wanted to get him diagnosed. And he did progress, and the reason why he progressed is because we became vegan, and so we autom automatically got rid of the dairy and the, the casein that was bugging him. I didn't know it back then, but I knew I know looking back now why. But by the time he was five, he still didn't have any speech that anybody could understand. He stopped looking at me. He stopped letting me hug him. He flapped his arms when he was excited or when he was um, scared. He had a lot of anxiety. He had a lot of obsessions. Pika drooled at the age of five. A lot of digestive issues, a lot of ear infections. Um, he had no social ability whatsoever. Somebody could look at him and talk to him and he would just turn and look the other way and, and run away. He, and speaking of running away, he ran away a lot. <laughs> um, that was his thing. He loved to run away. He had sensory integration disorder. Um, and on and on and on these symptoms went and I was angry when they diagnosed him and I was one of those people who just thought you're diagnosing everybody but I didn't understand what autism was and so now looking back I'm so grateful that they diagnosed him because you know what I took it seriously I took the label seriously I took him more seriously I took his symptoms more seriously and I realized that Donna He's not going to outgrow this. And you have worked with adults with autism, and I had, and I saw his future. And when they finally told me that his only hope was 40 hours of therapy, I, I, I just couldn't, I didn't want to believe it. I just saw his future pass before me, and that this is the way he would be for the rest of his life. Would he have friends? Would he be able to be married one day? Would he be able to have kids one day? And finally, I realized that two weeks before that was the time that I'm sharing with you that we got rid of gluten because he had had such stomach issues and nobody was helping us. The doctors weren't helping us and I couldn't understand it. And I realized that in those past weeks, he was looking at me differently than he had in years. And he had finally said some things in his speech that was different and it was almost like instead of echolalia that he had which was just repeating things that i said he would actually talk back with one word and i understood him of course nobody else around me did but i understood him and and i looked back at that moment and i thought is it possible that the gluten and the dairy that we had gotten rid of has something to do with his symptoms and so I went home that night and I started Googling gluten and, and dairy and autism. And I saw thousands and thousands of families like mine who have been there before me and have, and have and minimized so many symptoms. And in some cases, they had eliminated them. And I'm not here to promise you that this is going to happen to you, your son or your daughter or your grandchild. But what I am saying is that if you know that there's something that you can do to give them a better night's sleep, or if you know that there's something that you can do to help them be in less pain, then wouldn't you do it? And if you get them in less pain, and if you help them have better sleep, don't you know that maybe, just maybe, some of these symptoms that they have will be minimized? Maybe their temper tantrums won't be so so earth shattering for themselves and for the siblings and for the parents and that life can get even just a little bit easier. And I share this story with you because now he's 
turning 11 tomorrow. And do you know that he, he has no more symptoms of autism? And if you were to talk to him today, he would look in your eyes and he would have conversation with you. And the doctors now want to remove his label. And it has been five years since his diagnose, diagnosis. When they told me that this is a neurological disorder that he would have for the rest of his life. And I have shown and I have given evidence for the fact that that is not truth. Not for me. And I wish somebody had come along to share this with me. And so I want to offer just a little bit of hope that even if there's something you can do, wouldn't you do it? These are some of the links that you can be served by with um, Healthy Little Sprouts. That's my website, hippocratesinstitute.org. This is my number one choice. Great Plains Lab is where you can get IgG panels and other different panels. Uh, Candida, right? You can get stool tests. AutismOne.org is a, is a fantastic resource. GAPS Diet, for those of you who can't jump into Hippocrates right away, and, and, and I don't expect people to because it is a, a very extreme approach, but one that I think if you're a diver, you should go to. But um, GAPS Diet is is another extreme approach, but again, allows for um, a wider range of food. New Optimum Nutrition for the Mind. This is some of the, this is a book that can offer some of the direct studies that talk about blood sugar regulation and violence, you know, the link between those two and, and other things uh, that um, people with autism or ADHD uh, the, the studies behind it. This is a, it's a powerful book. I highly recommend that book. And for those of you who do want to get a hold of these doTERRA's products, and doTERRA means gift of the earth, and so I call these uh, products doTERRA's gifts of the earth. For more information, you can actually go to essentialoilexpert.com and tell them I sent you for your chance to actually get 25% off the retail price. Or you can contact me directly at Donna at HealthyLittleSprouts.com. Thank you so much for showing up to this webinar and for opening your minds. And I hope that your minds were open through this webinar and that you now can look further into some of the individual points that we brought up here today. I hope I've empowered you and educated you to looking further into this and that maybe, just maybe, I've offered hope where you never felt it before. Thank you so much for joining me today. Such love for you. You are doing such fantastic things for your child, and you have my full support. Have a great day. Bye-bye.